Okay, good morning, everybody. I see we're still getting more and more participants in, but I think we'll get started in the interest of time here. Um, I am Philip Fraley. I'm the Operations Branch Chief in the Mountain Plains Regional Office for uh, Food Nutrition Service, USDA. I don't know, I know a lot of you have heard this before, but I, I think it's important I give a little bit of background because I know we're, we had at least um, 500 register for this uh, particular webinar this morning. So I want to give a little bit of background on how we got where we're at. So about three years ago, um, the administration came to the Mountain Plains region because we had um, done a lot of work on um, data aggregation and collecting data and so forth and asked if we could put together a product or show in some way the impact of nutrition education that it has on our clients, right? We wanted to show that what the taxpayers were giving us for funding actually made a difference in people's lives and that we were actually making an impact out there in, in our communities with our, with our clients. So with that tasking, we, we met with incredible people around um, state agencies here in the Mountain Plains, the implementing agency leadership, um, tremendous uh, a set of people that came together in Kansas worked with uh, the PARES team, the evaluation system that is, that is in many, many states right now, taking a look at um, how do we collect this data? What can we show? And that product was the first um, regional impact report, which is about, I think, three years ago, give or take now. Um, that impact report was very successful. It did show just in the Mountain Plains region, our 10 states, the tremendous impact that we are having in people's lives with this program and that it is worth funding and continuing to, to fund going forward. From that, now we've done several different impact reports um, over the last several years. One of the challenges, there was many, many challenges, but one of the main challenges we ran into in our first impact report was um, data aggregation. We realized that there was some um, issues there that we needed to work through. We developed a work group within the Mountain Plains region and continue to work through the data aggregation and improving that. Um, I want to just say before I kick this over to the Southwest region, um, how thankful I am for the amazing professionals, the amazing ladies and, and, and teams that we have in this region, both at the state agency to the implementing agency level. Um, just amazing work that they've done and continue to do across many spectrums, not just this impact report. So I want to thank them in that. As we got into a couple of impact reports, we realized that we wanted to expand this beyond just the Mountain Plains region. We want to start bringing in um, other regions uh, within FNS and in and, and their respective states and the great work that they're doing. So we partnered with the Southwest Regional Office and um, started working with Gregory in, in that region, start bringing those states in so that we could do a cross-regional report. This is what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to again ex extend um, thanks to the great leadership of Gregory and his state and implementing agencies that came on board um, and helped us build this first cross regional report. And, and I'll turn it over to Gregory now so that he can say a few things. But again, thank you for the amazing team that got us to this point. Gregory? Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I appreciate you guys. My name is Gregory Jones out of the Southwest Regional Office. I'm the um, SNAP Ed coordinator here. Uh, I first, uh, a word of thanks to all the staff of both regions, uh, Mountain Plains and Southwest Region our state agencies and implementing agency staff uh, for sharing uh, their knowledge, their expertise, and uh, SNAP-Ed experience through impact reporting. Uh, we especially thank uh, Utah and Wyoming for their collaborative uh, partnership with our cross-regional teams. Uh, with your help and coordination efforts, we were able to bring our state agencies and implementing agencies on board to share their stories on the effectiveness and impact of SNAP-Ed. And with the support of database outcomes and participant success stories, uh, we are very enthusiastic about the upcoming report year uh, in which we will continue to highlight uh, the outstanding impact SNAP-Ed has in the lives of the individuals and families we serve. Uh, we're excited to show how effective the program is in encouraging long-term behavioral changes uh, with our participants. And we look forward to the opportunity of developing a national report uh, that speaks to the value of nutrition education programming. Uh, again, thank you all again for your great support. Uh, I won't keep you long. I'll turn it over to Kaylee and Casey to get the, um, the cross-regional report uh, presentation started. And thank you again. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to share our 2019 SNAP-Ed cross-regional report with you. 
Um, today we're going to go through how we created the 2019 report. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about gathering data from a state agency perspective. We'll share some about the data aggregation process specific to the Mountain Plains region and end with some best practices and some takeaways before we have some question and answer. My name is Kaylee McCracken Goodenough and I'm with Wyoming SNAP-Ed. I had the opportunity to design the report this year and I'll be starting us off. So um, I wanna walk through the timeline of the project first. Projects of this scale take some time. And as you'll note in the next slide, the 2019 report took us several months to put together, but we did have some unusual circumstances that kind of interfered with things. So um, as Phil and Gregory said, this report has um, been in the process for several years. It started in 2017 and Utah um, helped coordinate and design that report for the Mountain Plains region. But when Utah moved to the Southwest region this year, the report design transitioned to Wyoming. Um, at that point, we were thinking it was still going to just be a Mountain Plains region report. And so um, Wyoming and I volunteered to take on that, the, the design and the kind of pulling together of everything. In January, um, a, a group from the Mountain Plains region worked on collecting Mountain Plains region data for aggregation. And I developed data collection template plates and our new um, developed the new design for the 2019 report. Um, and all of this was in preparation for the Association of SNAP Nutrition Education Administrators Conference, the ASNA conference, which takes place in February. So at that conference, I presented the new templates and design to the Mountain Plains region. We also presented our um, aggregated data as um, a session at ASNA. Um, after ASNA, I made some adjustments to those templates and shared them with the Mountain Plains region. And then um, some discussion about the possibility of a cross-regional report began. And so we met with the Southwest region at the end of February. In March, um, the Mountain Plains region state started sending in their data to me so that I could begin layout. Um, a group of us met with the individual Southwest region states to discuss the process of the report and how to kind of pull that data together. And then of course, coronavirus hit. And so everything got put on pause for us for about six weeks. Um, we, when we picked things back up in April, um, we went through the whole design and layout process. The Southwest region states were amazing and turned around their data in about four weeks and gave me what I needed to put those pages together. Drafts were shared back and forth for edits. Um, we made those final additions and then finalized it at the end of June. Our files were out to the printer and then sent out across um, all of our regions in July. And I started working on the ADA compatibility of the PDF in August. That compatibility aspect is still in the works. I'm, I'm close to done, but we're not quite there. Um, so that's, that's being wrapped up. And then here we are looking to start the 2020 data collection. So the new templates, um, we're gonna work on some that will include uh, capturing our COVID data. But so that's kind of our timeline um, from when this started last year to where we are today. Um, so I'm going to switch a little bit and talk a little bit about our approach for 2019. In 2017 and 18, we learned a lot about how to do a regional report and what was necessary to pull that together. When the report transitioned from Utah to Wyoming, I saw it as an opportunity to really streamline and simplify the process. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. For the 2019 report, um, I really wanted us to, sh to show and really focus on our highlights for each state. Um, all of us do an amazing amount of work and there's so much data that we could share, but I really wanted to focus on the key things that stakeholders could walk away from the report knowing um, that would be helpful for them to really understand our impact. So we focused on the highlights and we also focused on commonalities. So data aggregation isn't necessarily possible across all states and both regions. And so instead, um, I suggested that states look at common data points that we might share. So we all are unique programs, but we work towards common goals like increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, increasing physical activity. And so um, I tried to, to suggest that we do that. And then we also work, um, we all use a multi-level approach. So wanting to represent all of those approaches across the region. Um, so this um, page that I have up is Utah's page. It's very similar to how many of the Mountain Plains and Southwest region pages looked. We covered the individual impacts, the community impacts, um, and that included PSEs and social marketing campaigns. And then each state also had two pages for success stories. The, the rest of my approach, um, 
included kind of three different aspects. Like I said, we focus on commonalities, but flexibility was really important. While we used a similar page layout for lots of the states, um, there were some instances where the data that the state had available didn't quite fit in with that um, structure. And so we were able to adapt the layout of the report to be able to put their best data forward. And so I'm showing um, the New Mexico page, their programming was a little bit different in 2019 than they normally do. And so we worked together to develop um, the pages so that they were able to really show their impact and what their, their efforts were. Um, the other, the last two pieces of the approach um, were really more from a design perspective. And the first being, I wanted it to stay very simple and straightforward. Um, I didn't want people to look at the report and be overwhelmed by the data. So I tried to have a good balance of that white space and the information with the clean and clear design for readability. Um, the graphics were a huge emphasis, um, and I wanted to do that so that there was key takeaway information that was easy to digest at just a glance. And the last part of my approach um, was making the, the report really approachable. Um, I wanted enough data to tell the story, but not overwhelm. And I would try to limit and work with states to limit unfamiliar jargon for people who don't know SNAPED as well as we do. Um, so you'll notice um, on some of the pages, I, um, instead of calling them PSEs, we call them community impacts because that's a more um, easily accessible term to understand what we're working towards. Um, so, so this is sort of the layout of, of the two, the, the report and the pages. And then, as I mentioned before, we had data collection templates. I did two versions or two, two of them. One of them was a checklist um, and it offered guidelines for things like the word count for success stories to fit in the space that we had available, some suggestions for what types of data states might look at and pull, um, and just some general guidelines and other things I needed like logos and that sort of thing. The other piece of it was this Excel document and we used that to capture our quantitative data related to direct education and PSEs and social marketing. These two templates were shared at ASNA and then um, I made a few tweaks in February and then shared with the Mountain Plains region. When the Southwest region joined us, we made a couple more tweaks um, to the templates just to make them a little bit more familiar and easy to use for the Southwest region. Um, so Casey is going to talk a little bit more about our process of working with two regions. Great, thanks, Kaylee. Uh, yeah, I'm Casey Coombs. I'm the assistant director of the SNAP-Ed program here in Utah. And this year, I or this past year for fiscal year 2019, I had the opportunity to help onboard the Southwest region states into the cross-regional report. Um, I think Kaylee mentioned this, but it's important to note that this was the first year that Utah and Arizona were part of the Southwest region. Um, so we did have the additional um, obstacle of getting to know our region and figuring out who the best contact people were and the different structures of, of our um, of our new region. But we were able to work through that with Gregory's help at FNS and were able to successfully pull together this report. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about the steps and considerations to bringing on a new region um, and, and gathering all of their data together. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, the first step obviously is just assessing interest and support from a new region. The timing of this for our new region worked really well. Uh, like Keely said, we did a presentation at ASNA and then we had our new region group meeting right after that presentation. So people, many people were familiar with the report and were actually able to even view the report we had done the previous year as part of the Mountain Plains region. And everyone from the Southwest region jumped on board really quickly and were very supportive and ready to get to work to get our um, data together for the 2019 fiscal year. The next step I'd recommend for people wanting to pull regional data together is to identify one to two people within that region to act as the contact person. And that person will act as the contact for the people within the region, the implementing and the state agencies, as well as work with the other regional contacts, or in, in our case, Kaylee, who was compiling the report. And the role of this person is helping to schedule meetings, to manage and develop the Google folders for people to drop their templates of data into, uh, help with data collection and review, and follow up with states. 
I know in the Southwest region, we have a lot of really large states with, with multiple implementing agencies. So to have one person kind of keeping an eye on all of it and making sure things were coming in regularly and to answer questions and emails about it was really important to pulling it together smoothly and getting it ready to be compiled into the cross-regional report. From that point, uh, it's, it's essential also to identify contacts within each state. Uh, within the Southwest region, we had some states that preferred we worked directly with the state agencies to gather data. Um, and then in other states, the preference was for us to gather data from each of the implementing agencies and bring it into a Google folder, which then the state agency could go in and select the highlights that they wanted to put into the report. Uh, Kaylee also mentioned this. Another step was just to slightly modify the templates that she shared. Um, the Mountain Plains region, as, as, been, as has been mentioned, was working on this report for over you know, three years. So everyone was very familiar with the templates and the data and what was being requested. Uh, so we just added some slight clarifications and additional narratives into the templates to make them a little bit more um, user friendly for people that were new to the report and to the templates. So, um, and another thing that was on the templates that Keeley shared was just um, reiterating that while, you know, these were the recommended impacts to share um, based on priority indicators, if that data was not something that was collected from the state or not what the state wished to highlight, it was okay to change them out for some other things and adding some ideas of what other data could look like in those places of the, in the individual level impacts or the community impacts. So once we've identified the contact people, the regional contact folks that and modified the templates, we sent around the templates and requested a two to three week turnaround. Um, I think this was a, a reasonable amount of time and it was about four weeks total before we got everyone's, which, which worked out well. Um, I think it's also just important to note that we were asking people to kind of dig back into data that they had already kind of tucked away. So it took, you know, people had to go back and spend a little bit more time collecting the data to put into the templates, which is something uh, Kayla will talk about how we're changing the process for this, this coming report for fiscal year 2020. Um, once the state agencies or the implementing agencies got their data into the templates and into the Google folders, Kaylee and I reviewed it to make sure we were clear on what was being reported, set up individual or small group meetings to clarify the data to make sure everyone was just on the same page before it was going to be plugged into those templates. Okay, next slide. Uh, so once all of the data was in templates and it was understood by Keeley and myself, uh, we, we brought it to the state agencies and started the data consolidation process. So initially when we were uh, developing the report, we thought um, each implementing agency would be able to have their own set of three to four pages like you'll see in the, the report each state has. But we soon recognized that due to the amount of implementing agencies uh, in the Southwest region, that would make a really bulky report that would kind of um, defeat the purpose that we were going for just a nice, succinct um, highlight report that people could move through pretty quickly to see all of the great in the work that um, SNAP-Ed was doing in these two regions. So we decided that it would probably be best to work with the state agencies to have them consolidate the, the data down to those top five um, individual or top 10 individual level impacts, top five community level impacts, and so on. So to help facilitate that, we created a consolidation checklist just to help people, um, help the state agencies make sure they got everything they needed from all of the implementing agencies and put it into a nice package to easily be plugged into the report templates. Uh, once we had all of that, then Kaylee already spoke about this. She designed the pages, sent them back and forth with the individual states to make sure they it was exactly how they wanted it presented. And then the feedback and finalization process happened. And this took about, which Kaylee mentioned, about a three month process once we started the conversation with South the Southwest region. Um, so I think new regions coming on, if, if you plan for three months, you'd probably be safe. We had the added um, excitement of COVID-19 and the start of that, as well as getting to know a new region as the contact people. So I think allotting three months would probably be sufficient for pulling together a region's data. And then just a few considerations. Uh, next slide, yep. Um, just, Keely mentioned this. And just the importance of reiterating that this is just the highlights of the program. We all have so much data, especially some of these um, really um, 
uh, states that have multiple, multiple implementing agencies, it's really hard to skim down the data just to focus on your top ones, but just reiterating and supporting people that these are just highlights and we can always refer stakeholders to our more detailed state reports um, in the future. And then the adaptability just refers to finding that balance within your region or the cross region of, you know, sharing SNAPED's collective story with the um, by reporting on the same impacts, but also showcasing the the um, flexibility of snap edge to be able to be adapted to specific audiences. So kind of finding that balance of, of collective story, but also showing the uniqueness of each state's program. And this I've said a couple of times, just designating those, those contact people and really taking the time to understand the relationship and the roles of your state agencies and your implementing agencies and recognizing that those likely vary across state and um, just identifying the right people will make that communication so much more efficient and effective and effective. Casey. Um, and then, yeah. Um, you have one question. Can you clarify what the consolidation checklist was? Yeah, sure. That was just for the state agencies that were going to pull together all of the data from their, their implementing agencies. So it's, you know, it was just make sure you've included your state summaries, your state community impact summaries however many individual level impacts, I think it was 10, um, however many success stories they were allotted in the report, their logos for both the IAs and the essays, just so they had one place to look to make sure they were picking up all of the pieces they needed to, to be plugged into the report. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to Kaylee. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna finish up talking about this 2019 report um, creation with a little bit about the technical aspects and the ADA compliance. Um, I used Adobe Illustrator and Adobe InDesign to put a report like this together. Um, it probably is possible to do a report like this using tools like Microsoft PowerPoint, um, but the design tools that are available like InDesign definitely make this an easier aspect. Um, and so that was, I think, something to consider for states thinking and regions thinking about this. Um, is having someone who knows these tools is definitely a way to make the report easier to put together. And then um, kind of a last consideration is um, for reports that are gonna be housed online as a PDF, of course they need to be ADA compliant. Um, for me, this was definitely a learning process, which is part of the reason it's taken me a few months to do this. Um, someone had asked me, do, you know, does having a standard layout make it easier to do the ADA compliance? And that's kind of a mixed answer. Yes, um, the consistency is easier to navigate through the report and know what needs to be done for ADA compliance, but at the end of the day, each item on every page needs to be made compliant. And so it's just at the end of the day, a very timely process. Um, so I think that's something to consider that to get a report put together and printed is about three months. And then I would plan in probably another month to make the ADA compliance possible. Um, so we're gonna kind of pause with talking about the specific design and creation of the 2019 report and switch to Diana, who's gonna talk about a, um, a state agency perspective of pulling together multiple implementing agencies. So, Diana. Hello, my name's Diana Driver. I am with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. I'm the program supervisor of Texas SNAP Ed. So I'm going to give you our state agency perspective when it comes to having multiple implementing agencies and how we got this done. So next slide. All right, so in 2019, we reported seven implementing agencies. So these are nonprofits and universities. So we've got Common Threads, Beating Texas, It's Time Texas, MHP Salud, San Antonio Food Bank, um, and let me clarify, Feeding Texas is also a network of food banks, um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and then UT Health Brownsville's Tu Salud Sequenta program. So we have a lot of implementing agencies, um, and in 2020, we'll be adding, or we have added six more, so I know our reporting's gonna, we're gonna have to come up with our plan for next year, but seven implementing agencies. And just, I wanna give some background on how we work with implementing agencies. So we do a competitive bid process, the requests for proposals. And so with those proposals, agencies propose the outcome measures and performance measures that um, 
will be used. And so there are some, we'll get into it a little bit later in the presentation, but why we reported the way we, we do is because of the way we procure and manage our contracts. So end of year reporting, just giving some further background, our implementing agencies submit EARS forms and their own annual reports. Um, our schedule is they send those at the end of October every year so that we can compile, verify, edit, revise um, the EARS forms so that we can put them into FPRS by the end of December. And then we compile the annual report submitted by implementing agencies into a state annual report. And the, our approach is we have a section in our annual report per implementing agency. Um, and we submit that to FNS by January 31st. So just giving some background. So the report checklist. Um, so this, what we added to that checklist was logos of our implementing agencies, because we feel it's very important to highlight our agencies. Um, we included a summary statement, um, which was pulled from our annual report executive summary. So that was really easy to collect and get done on the checklist. Then success stories that were part of the checklist um, we extracted that from the, our annual reports that were submitted by implementing agencies. Also, we implement a monthly report with our agencies. And so a lot of times they share photos and other success stories that we extracted for this report. So kind of reiterating what um, has been said before, we already had a lot of the information. So it was just extracting it getting it together and putting it into the templates. All right, so we'll go to the report data collection form. So Annie Perfirio, our program evaluator, um, extracted data. We'll create it a tab for each implementing agency in that template. Then she created extracted data from each evaluation report that's submitted with each implementing agency's annual report for the key impact data of that template, that data collection template. And then extracted data from the EARS forms for the community impact slash PSC data section of the template. So again, we already had all of the data and information. We just needed to put it into the template shared with us. So if you go to the next slide, um, so key individual impact data, data collected from, sorry, I got a message that my audio is breaking up. It actually sounds pretty good on my end. Okay, okay. So I'll keep going. So in the data collection form template, the first section is that key individual impact data. So data was collected from the evaluation report submitted with the implementing agency's annual report and the specific sections that are evaluation reports that our implementing agencies submit, um, where we pulled data was outcome and impact measures section where they describe the measures they used and then the results section. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just give a quick visual so I, I know you might not be able to see that perfectly, but this is just an example of an annual report that we would receive from an implementing agency. So the information is already there. They have their evaluation reports are designed to collect this type of information. So that was very helpful. Um, that outcome impact measures section, you'll see some color coding where each measure is highlighted um, so for instance, that yellow highlight then was connected to the yellow result section. Um, and so once we, so we took the information from the annual report and then put it into the data collection form. So if you go to the next slide, then you'll see, and it, the color coding goes along with that, just to provide a visual of how we extract the data and put it into the data collection form. Now, we did this for each implementing agency. So we had seven. So you can imagine that our data collection 
template turned into multiple tabs with a lot of information. But as has been stated before, we really wanted to highlight the key information um, and consolidate. So if you go to the next slide, Dr. Christina Tai, our program specialist, one of our program specialists um, developed final selection criteria. And so what we did was we had all this data, she developed some selection criteria based on strength. So in the report, whether it was just statistically significant, you know, that was taken preference and then tangibility of outcomes. So eating and activity behaviors were prioritized over knowledge and awareness. So an example of how this works is we decided to take key impact data point from just one data point from each implementing agency to highlight in this impact report. And so if an agency um, had multiple measures on eating and knowledge, we and if the eating was statistically significant, we chose that one to highlight. Um, so that's just a rundown of how we made our final selection for the report. So if you'll go to the next slide. So this you'll see, so we had seven implementing agencies using that final selection criteria. We selected one for each agency. Now you see that there are six um, and we'll get to, there's one, one of our implementing agencies is very community oriented. So they're highlighted in the community impact section, but you'll see there that we used our selection criteria and highlighted for each implementing agency. All right, next slide. All right, so then the next section of that data collection form template was community impact slash PSC data. So um, data for this section was collected from the EARS form. So we already had everything. And I highlight here what particular parts of the EARS form we pulled data for this template. So item five was the, was, was the part of the report we pulled from for community impact. Um, reach, setting sites, that's where we pulled it. Um, and this next bullet out comes from It's Time Texas Annual Report. So this is our implementing agency that is very community impact oriented. So they were highlighted in this section instead of key individual impact. Um, Texas did not use the supports adopted section of the collection form and we did not use outcomes as impact data um, because we had already provided that. So, and as stated previously, there needs to be room for flexibility um, in working with other states. So, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this was, this is the result of the work that we did. So you'll see um, the reach, the initiatives and the sites that were highlighted, that's all pulled from the EARS forms, which we had compiled into an Excel spreadsheet um, to aggregate that data. Then you've got a few other things highlighted, the Common Bytes mobile app, the Teach Healthier and Community Challenge. Those are projects specifically implemented by the It's Time Texas implementing agency. So we highlighted them here. We wanted to make sure that all of our agencies were highlighted in the report. Okay, and that was the that that is the conclusion of Texas. So that was our approach. Um, Christina, we have a quick question for you. I mean, sorry, Diana. Christina was answering other questions for you. So thank you for that. Um, the other one is is are the implementing agency reports just for your state agency, or do they share um, the reports publicly? So the I reports we've never shared publicly. Um, we compile into a state annual report and we haven't made that public, but it, I mean, as a public agency, all of our all of our documents can be made available to the public. Thank you. 
All right, I'll jump in now. This is Max Young from Colorado, um, and I am joined by Sue Sing Lim, my colleague over in Kansas, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the data aggregation process that our region went through um, for this report. So to kind of start us off, I'll, I wanted to give just an overview, an example of what the outcomes looked like. Um, so here on the side, the five indicators that you see are the outcomes of all of the hard work that went into this aggregation process. Um, you can see the numbers, the percent, how we visualize the information, and then the indicators that we have listed. And our goal throughout the next few slides is really to talk through how we got to this point. Um, we did do a more in-depth um, presentation at ASNA last year. Many of you might have been there. Um, so we'll kind of do just more of a brief overview, but if you have any additional questions, we're happy to answer those. All right, so a lot of the background of how we got to this point has been covered, um, but I did wanna just kind of give a little bit more information. Um, this work actually started in 2015, which feels like a lifetime ago, and it started with a regional survey. And this regional survey was distributed to all of the states within our region, Utah and Iowa at the time were both included. And this survey meant to identify all the, pro the common program areas that were happening amongst our, amongst our teams and amongst our implementing agencies. And around the same time as this regional survey, PEARS was being introduced as this potential platform to help us collect and report on our outcomes. So we kind of started with this survey that helped us to understand where we are and what we're doing. We were introduced to PEARS and then went into the first regional report. And this, was, this happened around 2017 or FFY 2017. And it consisted of small work groups that were comprised of program directors or evaluators, much of which um, Philip shared earlier. Um, in this small work group, we really work to understand what information do our stakeholders really want to see in this report? So what tells the story about SNAP-Ed and how do we get at those needs? Um, and I will say that this, while it was certainly what I'll call like a grassroots effort, you know, us at the table, at the drawing board, at the whiteboard, crafting out what this will look like, it's none of it would have happened without um, the Mountain Plains regional leadership that we had from Star Morrison, Zora Cobb, and Philip Fraley. So we really do want to say thank you for your leadership and support through this process um, and developing such a collaborative approach for all of our states to truly work together. So FFY19 or 2018, excuse me, is where we actually started the aggregation discussion. This is where we began to formalize how we're gonna actually get there. So we started with monthly meetings. We talked through our inclusion and exclusion criteria, some of which we'll, we'll go over here shortly. We talked about how we collect the same data. And then again, similar to what, what you saw in earlier presentations, how do we streamline this process? How do we get states to enter their own data into a template that helps us to inform the aggregation process as well? So looking more at the 2019 report, this is again where we began and um, presented on aggregated outcomes. We, we did this through looking at these kind of four different buckets. We have common indicators, so where are we doing things similarly, what questions we have and how we're evaluating those outcomes, um, and then what are the response options associated with those questions, what methodologies are being used in evaluation practices to collect that data, and then how are programs um, doing an analysis on these outcomes, where are their similarities in what we're doing. Um, and similar to how other regions have done this, we selected three of the top priority indicators is just a good place to begin. MT1 through three, these are the priority indicators that FNS has outlined. It's where we began our work. And you can see the sub indicators listed there as well. So in order to have what I'll say good quality to our aggregation, we had to create inclusion criteria. This helped to ensure that there's some sort of standardized approach when we're looking at all of this data, all of this outcome, um, that can help ensure that we're doing things similarly and looking at things similarly between our, re our states and our programs. 
So we started with adult participants as being our first inclusion criteria. And this is because when we looked at the evaluation tools and strategies, it was a lot more consistent for adults than it was for our kiddos. Um, so we started with just adult participants. The second is that we looked at every question for MT1 through three and saw similarities. What we were looking at was to approve questions that could be added into the aggregation process. So we're saying, how did they word the question? Did it, was it for MT1 through three? What were the response options and was there consistency among that that we felt comfortable aggregating? We also looked at the programming structure. We wanted to ensure there was a lesson series and that there was a minimum amount of classes that would be met. So there was some sort of dosage effect that we knew was happening, that these weren't just one-time educational opportunities. We also looked at all of the evaluation strategies to say, we want to really measure behavior change. So we're gonna only include pre and post surveys as part of this criteria. Every state has different strategies. They have different ways of getting at the outcomes. We have a lot of brilliant minds that work on evaluation and SNAP Ed, um, and those types of evaluations that are different than what we decided to include here are still um, strong evaluation models that should be supported and, and speak to the outcomes of SNAP Ed. The goal for this work has been aggregation. And when you talk about aggregation, you needed to have these some inclusion criteria that helps you to narrow the scope so you can speak to the quality of the data that you're, you're merging together um, and do it in the best way you can. So you're gonna hear it a few times, but we don't want to imply that there was one strategy that's better, one evaluation strategy that's better. We're talking about the outcome of aggregation. And then when you talk about that, that was what we had to focus on. And I think with that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sue Singh, to present on the next portion of our presentation. Thank you, Max. Um, this is Susan Lim. I'm the Kansas snap Program Evaluator. Our um, approved survey question characteristics are something that we have decided as a group to be included in our aggregation report. These survey questions are um, mostly from the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, or they're called FNEP, Food and Physical Activity Questions. Again, this, um, because mo most of our implementing agencies in Mountain Plains region use this survey question. However, we also included questions that are not from this particular survey. As far as with the outcome measures, the survey question asks about the frequency of eating fruits and vegetables a day or a week, the frequency of practicing food resource management skills. And we selected some of the more common um, asked questions such as if our participants are comparing prices, if they cook dinner at home, plan meals and make a grocery list. We asked also about um, food insecurity, about if they use the uh, federal food nutrition program such as SNAP or WIC. We also asked the number of days being physically active for at least 30 minutes. We want to remind you and probably will remind you again and again, we do not imply any of these questions are better than others. We mainly consider what kind of survey questions are mostly used in our region in order to aggregate data. I want to show you two examples of the survey questions that are related to MT1 fruit. MT1, for those who are not familiar, it is an indication of behavior changes of participants in regards to fruit consumption. The first example question is, how many times a day do you eat fruit? Examples are given. These are the response options. As you can see, they are frequency oriented, I rarely eat fruit less than one time a day, all the way to four or more times a day. And this is an example of the FNAP program, Food and Physical Activity Questionnaire from 2017. The second example of the MT1 fruit is, how often do you typically eat fruit? Looking at the response options, there are also frequency, not at all, once a week to more than once a day. Once a day. And this survey is from Cooking Matters for Adults, Parents, or Families pre-post surveys. 
Now come to the part where everyone will put their data into a template. You will, you will see today that a lot of our um, themes is about template because you're trying to aggregate data. We um, developed this Excel template having six columns. First column is to put in your state or implementing agency name. Second column is we want to know the survey questions that they consider. Third and fourth, um, as, you, as Max said before, we were looking at only match pre and post surveys. So um, we asked our colleagues to put down the number of match pre and post survey. The fifth column is number of participants in proof. And then we asked how did you calculate the number of improvement, just kind of get a sense of how the data or numbers are came about. Some of our implementing agency use WebNIRS. It's a FNAP program um, data collecting system. And some we use pairs. And this is the result. After collecting all the numbers, we add up the total of participants in pre and post and the number of participants in proof. The equation of how we calculated the percent improvement is we use the number of participants in proof divided by total number of match participants. In this example, this is 1,629 divided by 4,069, and that came out with 40%. We want to remind you again, it's not the best method. This is just what we agree upon on how to present our program outcomes. And so now I would like to turn the floor to Kelly. All right, we're gonna wrap up really fast. I um, we know we're getting a little short on time. Um, so we wanted to end with our key takeaways and best practices for getting started. Um, we had five key takeaways and they're loosely based on the five conditions of collective impact, but really informed by our process this year and in previous years. Our first one is communication and vision. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have constant communication. Um, we probably sent thousands of emails over the course of this report to make sure that everyone was working in the same direction and everyone had the support and information they needed to be successful. Um, similarly, having a vision and a purpose that's shared helps to unify efforts and bring everyone to the same page. And kind of the last part of this idea of the communication and vision is bringing partners to the table. And I think this is especially important for states with multiple implementing agencies making sure that agencies understand the process and that their voices are heard throughout this process. Our second um, takeaway is a flexible approach, which we've touched on multiple times. Um, as I showed previously, there was one state that had really worked in a different direction in 2019, um, which meant they had really different outcomes than any other state, but we still wanted to make sure that their um, impact and their story was told. And so we worked together um, to, for me to really understand what it is they had done in 2019 and then how to represent that in the report. Um, the, the templates, the report layout offer guidelines, um, but maintaining that adaptability is key to make sure that each, each state shines and feels good about their representation. Our third takeaway is collaboration. Um, as, it's, as we've talked about, um, this report required collaboration at the regional state and implementing agency levels. Um, and that collaboration kind of fed into different areas. We had to collaborate to learn from each other about new programs, new efforts, and new evaluation processes. Data collection is a collaborative effort across implementing agencies, states, and regions. And as Max and Sue Singh have talked about, aggregation and making the decisions to make that possible is a huge collaborative effort um, to help identify those key definitions, to maintain evaluation integrity, and to decide what to share and what to leave out. Our fourth um, takeaway is the idea of coordination support that Casey and I mentioned before. For this 2019 report, Wyoming and Utah coordinated the efforts with Casey and I acting as point people for questions, assistance with data collection and outcome representation. And this helps to, um, I think, make sure that people felt supported and knew who to contact um, if they had questions and needed to, um, to talk through some things. And then our last takeaway is the idea of small steps. Um, as we've mentioned at the very beginning, this cross-regional report really started with a conversation and moved from there. Um, for regions and states and agencies interested in reports of this um, size, 
I would say it's important to consider things like evaluation, commonalities, and goals. Um, where evaluation, of course, is the key to all of this. You have to have data. Um, and so looking at what tools and systems are in use and what things are common and how, report, how data is being reported is an important step. Um, is everything in place to do a regional report? And if not, what, what's needed to do that? Identifying those commonalities and the kinds of um, data being collected and the, um, the systems and tools being used is also important. Um, and I think aggregation is part of that commonalities, but also part of that goal. If, if aggregation isn't possible now, is that a goal for the future and how do you get there? And I think I just wanna leave with the one last idea that this is a process over time. Um, this has been three years of the report for the Mountain Plains region and our first year for a cross-regional report. And we've learned a lot along the way. So we're always happy to share our expertise and we wanted to thank you for joining us today. Um, so with that, we'll move to um, a short window of time for some questions. Um, here's a couple things. Um, what tools and systems did you guys use for data collection? Yeah, it says SurveyMonkey. Um, I believe we used Google Docs or Sheets. I'll let Kelly answer that. So, um, we used an Excel sheet and a Word document to collect the different types of data, and those were shared through um, Google Files. And then states could download those out, um, fill them in, and put them back in the files, and that way everyone had access to it. Um, so we didn't use SurveyMonkey or anything like that because I wanted to make sure that even the tools we used to collect data remained flexible in order to capture the unique aspects of everyone's programming. Um, you mentioned that one state was an outlier in terms of the SNAP-Ed programming and were able to ad adapt reporting for them for aggregation. Can you provide more details? That state's data was not aggregated. Um, so aggregation in the 2019 report was just for the mountain, in the Mountain Plains region for, um, I think it was six out of the 10 states. Um, we did not do data aggregation in the Southwest region this year. Another one is um, this, this has been recorded, yes, and will be available again to view. And um, I'm, it will probably be on Utah's YouTube video, but I'll make sure we share it out through the ASNA list. Is there a goal to eventually use one common survey tool to aggregate across agency states and regions? I really think that depends on what FNS wants, um, and I'm assuming probably because of language in the farm bill as well as th steps that you've we've seen them move towards. Um, I don't know if someone from FNS wants to answer. And maybe that's one we'll get back to you on. And what is your thinking about reflecting outcomes in the multi-sector and population result fears of influence? I can jump in and answer this. And this is Max. Anyone else can jump in as well. Um, so I, I think that we started with what I will call the lower hanging fruit as far as our strategies um, for at least aggregation for sure. And then our one side of our report does capture those um, PSE or multi-sector interventions and you have flexibility in how you report those. So what you might see is some variation between states and how they report what they're doing in multi-sector work um, or population level work. Um, I think that there is room for improvement and room for um, doing better in certain aspects of it. Um, so I would, I think that while each state sort of has the ability to craft how they talk about it, um, not all states are doing that. And so it's probably something to take back for a future conversation. Um, thank you, Sue, for your question. And Phil um, put a message in about uh, making it more of a, a report across agencies and states. And it says, I think we have a desire more than an established goal to, um, to aggregate across FNS and state, sorry, state agencies. 
And then the next question is, based on your experience, what models would you recommend to obtain states buy-in? Um, I'm going to just speak up because we moved from region to region and, and I, we were also in the first part when we joined and, and um, what I've experienced is that um, the idea was presented, uh, the information was presented on how we could possibly do this together. We got in a room and, and had a discussion on um, what it looks like and then um, we did it for three days and then we went back to our states and started hashing out uh, the first year's report and then over the next year more information came in over the year after that. It, it just takes time obviously to get where Mountain Plains region is. And then moving into um, the Southwest region, we just told them what we had been involved in and people were excited, wanted to, to be on board. And um, we just moved forward. It was, it was not really hard to get buy-in at all. It was just presenting what we had done and, and what we wanted to do. And Heidi, I might add on to that. Um, the, the beauty of this report, as um, Diana talked about, is the data generally already exists for you. You've probably already pulled it for other SNAPED reporting. And so it's not like you need to go in and find data in other places. Um, it's all there. It's just a matter of gathering those key points and sharing them. Um, and so the like with the Southwest region, I was so excited that they were able to turn data back to me in two to three weeks. Um, even in the middle of a pandemic and six months after they had done the initial reporting. So um, it there is some, a buy-in aspect probably for some states, but also know that the workload isn't huge necessarily for each state. Um, it's a lift by all states together. Great. Also, we have one more um, question, and this will probably be our last question um, due to time. Can you say any more about the challenges, efficiencies of using the template for ADA 508 compliance, time and cost savings? Yeah, this is a great question, Sue. Um, the ADA and 508 compliance is always going to be a timely process because it has to be done manually. And so there's no automizing any of that process. Um, using a template makes it, it consistent. So I know for each graph, the kind of um, compliance efforts that need to go into it, but that still has to be done for, um, by hand um, by a human being. And so it, it is a challenge. Um, it, it just, I don't know how else to say it. It's just going to be a challenge. There are companies that you can contract out to, um, but you would still need to provide all like alt text, um, all of these other things for, and they essentially do it for you. But there's still a lot of effort that has to go in on the front end um, by the designer or the group that's doing um, such a, an effort. So um, unfortunately, there, I don't think there's any way to streamline that process and make it faster as things stand currently. Um, just one last thing I'm going to put in chat, my email. Um, I was asked to put it in there and then we'll share it with the group. So if you have other questions that you want to email out, we'll share it, share them together as um, the core team and then we'll share them out with the answers in them. So you're welcome to email me. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, we're going to end the webinar now. And once again, it will be recorded and we'll share out where, where it is recorded.